Hi, I'm Rachel, and yesterday on May 18th, 2019, I attended the 10th annual Gaithersburg Book Festival. The Gaithersburg Book Festival is very local to me. It technically takes place in my home county, but it's actually becoming a, a relatively significant book festival on the national map. Uh, we get a lot of authors in various genres, uh, you know, just dozens and dozens in fiction and nonfiction, the fiction being for kids and for adults and in various genres. The kids section this year was really hopping. They had all sorts of read-alongs and make-your-own-books and uh, people in costume reading to the, to the children, of course. Uh, we have uh, lots of book sales with uh, local indie bookstore, Politics and Prose, and the library comes out to do a used book sale, and uh, there's lots of local organizations that are there, uh, including uh, the Maryland Writers Association, which is becoming, you know, my BFF, <laughs> at least in my head. I just uh, joined uh, last year in December, and then I uh, attended their uh, annual conference, which was amazing. Anyway, and also some local events. Anyway, I just, you know, it's just so much literary culture that's local, but it's also national. We get all sorts of big names, like last year Madeline Miller came, who wrote Circe. Uh, this year, a uh, few people that I recognized from Booktube uh, hype have been there, including Angie Kim, who wrote Miracle Creek, and I heard her in conversation with Eugenia Kim talking about uh, Korean culture and straddling the line between dual cultures, and I almost went and bought their books, even though I had a bag full of books. <laughs> I mean, the uh, panels that I went to were predominantly fiction-based, and I went to one uh, because I was about to get my book signed uh, by the lady, but she was, uh, most of these were uh, panels with various authors, and that always makes it much more fascinating, uh, just to hear authors in conversation with each other's ideas. But anyway, uh, what I enjoyed most about this panel with this uh, local author of story, short story writer who I was going to get a book signed by is that she was in conversation with Alice Stevens, who uh, is an adoptee, and she sort of wrote a reactionary fiction book uh, because a lot of non-adoptees were writing rosy uh, adoption books, and she wanted to... Uh, portray a more complicated reality, and uh, she's a, a woman of Korean descent, and she was saying, you know, actually most of the criticism I seem to get is from the white best friends of, uh, of, of adoptees who say, what are you talking about? My friends' lives are wonderful. And meanwhile, uh, in high school, I was the white best friend of uh, an adopted uh, girl from Korea, and all I could think of is a lot of what you're saying makes sense. <laughs> so it's just really fascinating the types of uh, insights you get from panels even when you're not expecting it. <laughs> I'm a big advocate for hearing authors talk about their work. <laughs> even if you don't agree with it and the story should stand on its own, it's still just fascinating to hear writers, especially in conversation with one another, talking about what drives them. I just, I love this stuff, and uh, I did, uh, vlog a little bit of uh, the event. It's always I always have fewer usable clips than I hope to. <laughs> uh, so the vlogging is only um, about a little under two minutes long, but then I also include um, a snippet of the panel uh, with Arkady Martin and uh, another panelist she was talking with uh, in the speculative fiction panel, uh, because uh, I think if you are in line with the Booktube SFF community, I think you've heard about a memory called Empire, or at least I have. I'm just roaring to read it. <laughs> I'm just very excited. And uh, uh, Arcadia Martina is uh, a uh, Byzantium professor, and so that uh, inspired a lot of her world building in this science fiction scale, and I'm just so excited, and so I included a clip of her and her panelist talking about uh, the cultural aspects of uh, creating their speculative works. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, post all of that for you here and hope you enjoy.
serendipity as if you sort of slid sideways into specular fiction because you know you were a scholar for many years mm -hmm. and yes Byzantium is many layered and complex so we can definitely understand mm -hmm. how it would influence the world building we do extremely and, much I stole yeah. a bunch uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know you here you are working in academia being very um, uh, forgive the modifier <laughs> straight and serious and uh, you know it was never you, a slide I was always doing both at once okay um, yeah. I've never, I mean, I didn't always think that I would like write professionally, but I have mm -hmm. always written. Okay. Um, I wrote fan fiction for years and still do sometimes. Um, I had been writing short stories all the way through grad school and had started to get them published. I finished my dissertation and apparently out of some kind of deep masochism decided that I immediately needed to write a novel. Um, <laughs> that is deep yeah. masochism. Um, I think I just didn't know what to do with myself I didn't have an enormous project hanging over right. my head. Yeah. Um, so I started the book that became A Memory Called Empire in the summer of 2014 uh, in Phoenix. Uh, basically as a, like, I've been thinking about all of these things about Borderlands and about mm -hmm. um, the way that people maintain culture in situations of trauma and pressure. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about all of this in the 10th and 11th centuries. Right. And I have a ton of very academic, very theoretical stuff I've written about. But I can't stop thinking about it. And the people that I'm writing about are real and they have real feelings and their experiences and why they chose what they chose a thousand years ago are things that I something like I want I want to tell stories, um, and yet they didn't leave all all the stories you needed. I mean, there are some. There well, are yeah, yeah but, but like that, everything that we have is preserved for a reason. All historical documents right. are we have them because someone decided to keep them for a reason. Um, we don't have accidents, really. Um, even our accidents aren't really accidental. Like the, the Cairo Geniza, where you have like all of this trash that's right. in a giant pit. Um, and we've gotten a whole lot of information about Jewish merchants in Egypt from people writing receipts on pieces of paper that were previously used for something else. Right. And yeah, that's an accident, but the fact that it got written down at all is not. Right. Um, so it was very, very simple to slip from one to the Excellent. other. Excellent. No, I think it, I was just reading a New York Times story a few weeks ago about the um, archive of ordinary women's clothing at Smith College. Mm -hmm. I'm an alum, so I'm always looking for stories about Smith. And I thought it was fascinating that this theater professor has started this archive. For, to remember things that I have a reason because a memory called Empire has a lot of clothing in it, which is very cool. Um, so, for instance, you know, a house dress. Well, what do you learn from a house dress? And, and many people over the centuries thought, oh, nothing. You know, who cares about what women are doing? But if you look at the pattern of fade, you can tell it was always worn with an apron. And so you can learn about how food was prepared and who was doing the domestic chores. And so, what are kind of fabric those people poured. Exactly. Yes. And in a memory called Empire, um, there are all different kinds of clothing. There's clothing for official functions. There's clothing for leisure. There's clothing for traveling between your space station and an actual planet. There, you know, and I thought, this is really cool. This is someone, this is a woman writing this big, fat, juicy, as I said, sci-fi novel. And uh, a man might have had everyone in gray spandex, but not <laughs> not, not every, every man. man. Not every man. Not every man. I, I'm being. I, I'm mm. huge generalities, mm. but I really appreciated the attention to um, design and uh, you know the, the the fact that this is important to people. Not so much for the aesthetics, even though that's cool too, but that people are, this is meaningful to the people. People care about clothes and they care yes. about buildings and they care about food. And there's this very bad writing advice that I get from a, like a lot of baby science fiction fantasy authors um, who I've taught in workshops. Uh, come to me, they're like, well, 
no, I don't want to do much too much exposition. It's like gonna bore people. People are gonna just like get bogged down. I can't describe anything. I just have to like have something explode and like a ray gun. And I'm like, no, no. People care about what people are wearing. They care about what they are eating, and they care about where they are. And I. This is actually something that I really love in your work, is how much attention you pay to clothing, because I suddenly got so much of the internal thought processes and decision making that your characters do relates to clothing. And um, it's actually something that was this, this weird, like, weird solidarity moment, like, ah, Black people must think about clothing the way women think about clothing. Right, and I and I was I was getting ready to say when you yeah. when you guys were just talking about that. One, I think it's it's such a cool, it's such an important thing, and I think I think a a big juicy kind of novel like that is made up of those like close appreciations, you know, those close appreciations. I think there's like a real pleasure in like getting to be immersed and seeing wow, look how look how closely this person's paying attention and therefore how closely I as a reader can now be engaged in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me I think um, whether it's using clothing as a way to sort of code switch or adjust how you're gonna be perceived in a space or also I worked in retail for a long time. The book is called Friday Black. Um, I, I, and that's what I wanted to talk about the story because one of the things it, that is so cool about it, it is that it does come from some experience that you had in retail at a mall. So could you share yeah. that story and then talk about how it works into Friday Black? Yeah, absolutely. So anyone who's worked for a long time in retail, I'm right here in solidarity with you. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I spent pretty much the only job before it, being in the school I, I worked in. I worked in the mall. And it was not my favorite thing to do at all. I worked in a big mall, Passe Mall in New York, and um, but I had to do that. And I also worked in college in the same store, all through college as well. Um, and you, you you pay attention to this stuff because it's sort of if you want to be a good salesperson, and like and so much of that is presenting earnestness, meaning and, and being able to present as though you're really engaged fully. Um, you guys sort of know what you're talking about. And so I know like way too much about North Face jackets right now. And um, because those were the things I sold. It was like the big ticket item. And you know, I, I know like it has these zip vents and it has this lifetime warranty and this faux fur on the thing and all these appreciations that you put them together and it, it sort of amalgamates into uh, successful people would have this, you know? And being aware of those details and paying attention and being able to sort of commune with someone on, in this case, a superficial, semi-artificial level, but that eventually almost becomes something real because, you know, it's... It does agree. eventually become something real. And one weekend you sold, what was it, $17,000 worth of North Face, North Face jackets? And here's the prize, one jacket. Yeah, and you know, so there's a character that's in the, in the story who has to sell a bunch to win the stuff. And I, I really, but also, I really had to do that once. And right. I mean, I think I probably sold and realized probably around there like sixteen thousand dollars worth of North how many Bay jackets on. is that well it was all i could sell not other subsides jackets okay. but um I, they put me in north face because like whoever's like the best they want to put you there this is like when north face was like really like the thing but some you know some of them are the time there was like it was called steve tech some of them were like five hundred six hundred dollars oh wow and like you could maybe get somebody buy three of them oh, once in a while goodness. you know so that's like a big ding 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 you know <laughs> yeah um and yeah and i got you get to choose one jacket and i wanted to get a jacket for my mom but um, what, what was interesting though is like you said, like people, things people care about. You know, it's, it's it's interesting to think about like and like why they care about that because like you know this thing you have around, it's like it's so ever present. It's something like I can sort of say to you without saying anything. This is who I am. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. yep. and also this is like my station in life. Maybe yeah. you know, it's like it's like the most obvious like station in life thing. So there's a lot of things you can play with it. So I I do have a lot of like appreciation for that close thing. And I'm back to wrap up this now long video with a little bit of a haul. I wanted to show you the 10th anniversary bag. It's a little bit crumpled because, of course, I had the great idea yesterday to put it on the bed and the cat is like, what is this? New seat. <laughs> so, <laughs> I also have a tradition of uh, every book festival I go to, or at least a significant book festival that I go to, I buy books and try get them signed for my niece and my nephew. So here's my politics and prose uh, haul. This first book is for my nephew Owen, whose first birthday it is today as I'm filming. This book is called Drawn Together by Min Lei. 
It's um, a Vietnamese writer, a uh, Vietnamese-American writer, talking about an intergenerational uh, and intercultural relationship between a grandfather and a grandson. And uh, they start with not having much in common. But then when they start drawing uh, sort of their alter egos, they find they have a lot in common. And then most of the rest of the book is pictures of uh, them sort of coming to a speechless uh, understanding of one another. So I found that fascinating, although I do uh, wish there had been more books that were marketed for, for infants and toddlers. Like last year I was able to get them a board book, but there weren't any board books this year. So I felt like this was the closest to something that could appeal to him and that could be interesting uh, for him to look at the pictures and maybe when he's older try to understand the theme of, uh, you know, people being different but being able to find common ground especially with family. <laughs> and the author was so nice when he signed. I told him it was Owen's birthday, so he wrote a birthday message. And he signed with today's date rather than yesterday's, because I told him he was born uh, on the 19th. So very nice guy. This next book I got for my niece, Grace. She's only five, but she reads middle grade with her mother, or more accurately, my sister reads her chapters every night. And she loves stories about uh, young girls and fantastical adventures, and so when I uh, read about this uh, author in this collection, I thought it would be up her alley. So, uh, this one isn't necessarily about princesses, which is her usual thing, but uh, it is about magic by way of a connection between a girl and her horse, and it does take place in a fantasy land, so I thought that would also be something that would appeal to Grace. Uh, and um, who knows, maybe now this will get her interested in a connection with horses because uh, the main thrust of this novel and uh, its sequel seems to be that the young girl and uh, the horse are able to talk to each other and have adventures. So I was able to get it signed and uh, it seems like a thing that um, some YA middle grade authors do now is they put in stamps when they sign of what their book is about, so that's cool. And finally, these are the two books I ended up getting signed for myself. I went a little overboard this year, but <laughs> I have some reasons. Uh, this was uh, the book that I was uh, gunning for from the beginning. This is the author uh, in that panel I was talking about earlier who I actually came to see. Her name is Caroline Bach, and this is a collection of short stories which was published by a very small press. This is from Washington Writers Publishing House. They have a contest every year for fiction and uh, poetry, and then they uh, publish two collections per year. Um, so I was interested in looking into this press, and I was also interested in her short stories because they're semi-autobiographical, and uh, her background is very similar to mine. She uh, has uh, a Jewish parent and an Italian parent, <laughs> so I was, uh, I came up to her when I got it signed and said, oh, hi, well, I'm also a short story writer, and I also have, like, you know, a Jewish parent and an Italian parent and that intercultural thing, and so we actually gushed and talked a lot, which is a really nice thing about going for authors who aren't the most popular. You can uh, have a more uh, personal connection, and I guess especially if you're a writer and you have something in common, that can be really nice. And so here's the signature. And this second book is a novel, Blessings and Curses by Judy Kelly. She is actually the uh, head of uh, the Montgomery County chapter of Maryland Writers Association, and she right now is graciously reading my novella uh, in progress uh, to give me uh, <laughs> critiques about it. Uh, and she was selling her book at uh, the MWA table, and I thought from the beginning when she first contacted me saying she'd be a beta reader that our the themes of our book sounded similar. So here's uh, what this book is about. Olivia Douglas is undecided about becoming a priest even after she has completed seminary. She is adopted and for most of her life she has a curse over her that she has held secret. In order to help her find out whether or not she is led to the priesthood, her parish priest gives her an assignment to pray with an inmate on death row. That relationship with the inmate makes her curious about her own life before she was adopted. Before he is executed, the inmate asks for Olivia's help, and in honoring his personal request, she discovers something in her past that threatens her to uproot her ordinary life with her adopted family and causes her to desperately struggle to hold on to her persona and position. So it's sort of vaguely similar, or at least it feels that way to what I'm writing because it's about uh, people from seemingly different backgrounds, uh, or at least different uh, relationships with the world, like uh, sort of a good girl versus a, a bad boy and uh, finding uh, common ground, uh, which is 
vaguely what happens in my novel. I might be reaching a little much, but she is reading my novella and I have I was curious about her book and I'm also curious about her press. She's also published by a small press, Black Rose Writing, which actually puts out a lot of books for a small press. So anyway, she wrote me a nice, if perhaps intimidating signature, so now I have to get published. <laughs> So that about covers it for me now. You know, it's just so great to spend a whole day traipsing around outside, even in horrible humidity, <laughs> uh, with a bunch of book lovers, with people grabbing at books and wanting to talk about books with authors and what, uh, you know, inspires people to write and to read. And uh, it's just such a wonderful uh, celebration of literacy and of reading and of imagination. And I'll leave links to the Gaithersburg Book Festival and to the small publishers down below. Uh, so you're, if you're ever in the Maryland side of the DC area, maybe you should give it a try or tell me about your favorite uh, book festivals that you go to. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.